Boston Strong. Nothing personal. Word of the day is Boston Strong. It is a Samson sit down with someone who I can't believe I have the honor of not just knowing, but having traveled the world, run the Boston Marathon with, basically been in his life as a hanger honor, I would say, for over a decade now. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so proud to welcome Dave McGilvery to our show, the race director for the Boston Marathon, but so much more than that, you are going to learn so much about ultra marathons, about what it is to be in the endurance world during the time of a pandemic, what it is to be a children's book author, what it is to run across the country, to run around the world, and of course, to do an Ironman, and to be the most charitable, greatest person, dad, just everything. Dave, I'm gushing here. Hi, Dave. David, you're far from being a hanger honor. You're, you're my mentor. You're, you're, you're a mutual admiration society here. <laughs> well, I think that's how it started with us. I got your name back before 2009 from Matt Roebuck, who was our head of public relations for the Marlins back in the day. And he knew you. I don't even know. How did you know Matt? Well, I'm not even sure I knew him. I reached out to the folks at Roger Dean Stadium because I wanted to put on a 10K in the spring because I owned a condo across the street and he must have recognized my name and then we met and then you and I met and the rest is, they say, history. So let me tell you what's funny about that. Roger Dean Stadium is where the Marlins have spring training. So what happened is that Matt Roebuck, being a PR guy, saw that he had a connection with a celebrity, which is who's you. And the hardest thing in the world, if you are a marathon runner, is to do the Boston Marathon. And the only way to do it is to qualify, which there's no chance that I could do because I'm very slow. Or you can raise money for charity. And even if you do that, it's still hard to get a bib number. Or you can see if you have a connection to this sort of omniscient guy named Dave McGilvery, the race director. So I would said to Matt Roebuck, listen, there's a bunch of us who want to do Boston. Is there any way you can get us in? Because, hey, I'm the president of the Marlins. There's got to be a way. Come on. Mm -hmm. And so he said, I'll give you his email. And I contacted you. And you let me start raising money for charity. And you helped that whole group in 2009. We raised a bunch of money for charity. And I want to tell you one quick Boston Marathon story. We were training in Florida, which is flat, for a Boston Marathon, which is hilly. And the only hills in Florida are at the garbage dump. It's an old garbage dump. And they put grass on it. So basically, you can do hill intervals on that garbage dump. So we were there. And I was with Mike Hill and a bunch of other people uh, who are not real runners. And I'm not a real runner either. And we were doing intervals on the hill and somebody who's in really good shape stopped us and recognized us and said, Hey, Hey guys, what are you guys doing? And we said, Oh, you know, we're training for the Boston marathon. And they looked at me, they looked at Mike Hill and they said, charity. <laughs> oh no. They put you right into a slot. <laughs> there was no chance that we could ever qualify. So how long have you been doing Boston? Well, um, directing at one level or another, this is 33 years, and running in it in one way, shape, or form, 48 years. So you've run the Boston Marathon 48 years in a row, and mm -hmm. as a director, what would you say, because we're going to have to talk about this, and it's not a pleasant conversation, but we have to talk about the bombing, mm -hmm. and I, I know exactly where I was, as do you. I was in, in Mike Hill's office, because mm -hmm. we were watching it's what we do. We were watching the Boston Marathon. And so yeah. we saw this happen. And we, we knew you obviously very well at that point. And, and uh, we thought of you immediately. Tell me, tell me about that day. I, I'm sorry yeah. to make you relive it. But for our listeners, that is a day where leadership was required. And you showed an amount of leadership that you can't plan for. You can't practice. And you did it. So what do you remember about that day the most? Well, David, the, the year before was the hot year. It was uh, almost 90 degrees for the race, and um, we were really challenged. Um, 250 people were, at, were um, we had a transport to area hospitals. We treated over 2,500 in the medical tent. So that was a tough year, an inferno, if you will. And then 2013 came, 
And I woke up that morning and the weather was perfect. And I said, finally, we got a good day. 2007 was a nor'easter. So I was just really looking forward to the day because everything was lining up perfectly. Got to the start and, um, you know, we had a 26 six second moment of silence for the 26 victims of the Sandy Hook tragedy. And you could hear a pin drop throughout the entire town of Hopkinton. It was a moment of silence for 26 miles into Boston. It was eerie, but it was like really poignant. And little did I know standing there during that 26 seconds, that six hours later, we were going to be experiencing our own tragedy 26 miles away. But the day unfolded, everything was going perfectly. All the starts went off great. I was on the lead motorcycle. You know, crowd was like massive. We crossed the finish line. Everything was great. I went, went to the service area, saw all my team captains. Good, good, good. Went into the medical tent. Not much carnage going on in there because it was such a good day. So very little business in the medical tent. And then I went up to the bleachers to see my family, my, my wife and kids and gave them a hug. And then the clock's ticking and I'm like, well, it's almost time to go. I usually run, as you know, the race after the, this race is over, I go back out and do it myself. And it was close to 3.30 or so, things were getting along. And I said, I might as well head back out. Let me so stop, Dave, let me stop you because you you just glossed over something that I want to give people an understanding. When you're the race director, you have to start in the morning. Boston is a point-to-point -point marathon. It starts in Hopkinton. It goes 26.2 miles and you end up, the finish line is in downtown Boston. So it's yeah. not a loop at all. And yeah. as a race director, you're responsible for the start. You're responsible for the finish. This takes a full year of planning, basically, in order to get all the volunteers coordinated, in order to get police and fire. And this is not a thousand person race. There's 30,000 oh. runners. Right. So what you do in the stress of being the race director, which is an extraordinarily stressful thing for anybody, it's like running a huge event. Then as the marathon finishes, the winners finish in, let's say, two hours and 10 minutes. People yeah. like me finish in four hours and 45 minutes. And there's some people who finish in six hours. Right. And then when the race is almost done, yeah. you actually go back to Hopkinton at the beginning and you run the Boston Marathon from start to finish every single year as the race director, but you do it not with a crowd, although there is a crowd now, but you do it because you run the Boston Marathon after a full day of work. So what you just said is in 2013, everything was going perfectly and it was a beautiful day. Not much, you said the word carnage, which is a, an interesting word to choose given what was about to happen. Because at the end of marathons, there's people, when I did Boston, one of the guys I did it with spent two hours in the medical tent because yeah. he had a Santa beard of salt after the run because he was so dehydrated. But you've got dehydration, you've got muscle injuries, you've got knee injuries, you've got people who pass out. But you're dealing with all that. And now you say, it's time for me. And it's a normal day. I'm going to head back to the beginning. Exactly. And so obviously for me, it's like the calm after the storm, typically. Um, you know, and, I, and people say, well, I, are you ready for this year's Boston Marathon? I said, I won't know until I get to the line because it all depends on what happens during the day. It isn't as much about my training as it is that day, the pressure, me trying to get something to eat, any kind of rest I could have at all, if that's even possible. Anyways, get back out to the start. I'm standing on the starting line and my phone rings. And it's someone at the finish line. They said, you got to get back here right away. There, were, there are two explosions. And I thought maybe generators or something along those lines, building situations. I don't know. I wasn't thinking of bombs. Why would you? And, um, and then it, you know, it, it, I got another call about the same situation. I thought, oh, this is serious. So the state police drove me back going 100 miles an hour down the mass turnpike. I got back to the finish in 20 minutes. I get into the security area, which had been totally evacuated, and I was able to get in because the state police escorted me in. And the first thing I did was I went into the medical tent. Now, only a few hours before that, I went in and there was hardly anything going on. I went in this time, and it was jammed, but not with runners. And so it was a very difficult scene for me to witness. And then I left the tent because I needed to go find my own family because I didn't know whether the bombs were 
where they were. So I went to go back up to the finish line out of the medical tent and the police officer stopped me and said, hey, where are you going? I said, I'm going up to the finish line to find my family. He says, you can't go up there. And I said, well, I'm the race director. Here's my ID. And he says, uh, it's not your race anymore. And that's when I realized how serious this was. That it wasn't my race anymore. It's a crime scene. And I couldn't find my family. The cell service all got knocked out. I was like, I didn't know whether they were victims here or not. So then I said, well, I got to get back to work because there were 6,500 runners that were stopped. And I said, my responsibility is not the medical tent, but my responsibility is those 6,500 runners. So I went down to the area where the buses are, where their gear bags are, and I needed to figure out how am I going to get all this gear back to these runners because they're not going to leave until they get their gear because in their gear bag is their keys and their passports and their, you know, whatever they need and they're not going to leave the area. And we, we didn't know whether there were more devices in the area. Police wouldn't allow the runners to go on to the buses because of that very reason. And I said to one of the officers, well, you have to allow me and some of my volunteers to do it because we can't get rid of these 6,500 people until we get the bags. So they allow, so we took like 10 of us took 600, 6,500 bags off of buses, put it on uh, Berkeley Street and had the runners come in one by one and pick through the bags and get their bag and leave. And the area's feeling was like all these bags are there as quiet as anything in the area now other than ambulances. And, and then in the bags were cell phones and you could hear the cell phones going off. And it was then I realized there are people all over the country, all over the world who, who are freaking out right now thinking that their loved one is in the Boston Marathon. They just saw bombs went off. They're trying to find their loved one and they can't find them and the phone is in the bag. You know, so time went on and eventually I got home two days later and my young son, Luke, comes up to me and he gives me a hug and he said, Dad, I never want you to direct that race again. And I, he associated my job with danger. And it's, it's a road race. But now it all changed, just like that. And about three months later, after we all started recovering and talk about the Monica Boston Strong, and he come up to me about three months later, he said, Dad, remember I told you I never want you to direct that race again? I said, yeah, Luke, I remember. He says, you know why? I said, why? He says, because I want to direct. And he had recovered, you know, and he was getting stronger. And, and then... And then we were able to kind of get through it and then came 214 and that was a whole epic year. You know, when, when the runners, you said you had 6,500 people on the course. So you have to imagine as a runner, you're running the marathon, you're at mile 15, you know, you haven't hit the wall yet. It's everything's normal because it's a point to point race. You don't have your phone. You have no idea what's going on. You're just running. How did you decide how quickly did you decide or was it the police officers who stopped the runners at each mile point or did they stop at a rest stop or did the whole race just come to a halt at once upon your call mainly it stopped um right about a less than a mile out and the mass ave underpass um boston police officers just literally jumped out into the middle of the street and said stop and then word get out that there were explosions at the finish and nobody was going to argue with the police at that point in time. It's not like stop because there's a detour. It's stop because there are bombs going off at the finish. So obviously all the runners cooperated, even though they were disappointed, they cooperated. But then the question became, what do you do with these 6,500 people just standing there? And then the decision was made to send them you know, down the, down the side road, not down Boylston, not down um, Boylston Street, but down... Commonwealth Ave to the Boston Common, and because th there's a big area there, but there's no resources down there. So then we had to bring them back towards the finish line, and that's when we had to give them their gear and get them out. So yeah, it was all public safety, mainly doing that kind of work, because it was obviously a public safety issue. When did you finally know that your family was safe? So I finally was able to reach them when they eventually got home probably six hours after the bombs went off. I can't believe that, Dave. That's not a pleasant six hours, but what no. you had to do to take charge, <clears throat> and it just started and it, and it changed. The marathon bombings, what, what bothered me and upset me that moment, and I knew it immediately when I watched it happen, is that, no, please don't take away my races. Now that people think that 
bombings can happen here too. It's going to change everything about how races happen with security. Everything that's so pure about a road race, it's now going to be infected because of these, these monsters who did this. And I, and, I, and I went into my logistics president of the Marlins mode, realizing like post 9-11, all the changes that I knew would happen. And here we are almost 20 years later, and those changes are never going away. Yeah. The changes to your marathon it's never going back to the way it was, Dave. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I agree. I'm, I'm hopeful that it gets toned down a little. Um, so what, what, what happened, obviously, is that the, the, the month or two afterwards, it was all about recovery and, and um, you know, paying tribute to th- those who were profoundly impacted, not just those impacted by physically impacted, but emotionally impacted family and friends and everything else, you know, over 250 people were physically impacted. Um, so then, then, you know, it's funny because the day after the race, I remember reading or seeing on TV, one of the elite athletes saying, when, when, when asked, will you be back? And she was like, I'm not too sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm not too anxious to come back here. You know, almost identifying that area in this race as being dangerous forever and ever and ever. And then, you know, over the, over the next week or so, you hear this groundswell of people all over the country and the world sort of saying, we'll be back, we'll be back, we're coming to Boston, we're coming to Boston, posters, and we're getting emails. I mean, you, you come to our office and there's stuff everywhere sent to us from all over the world, you know, food and posters and banners and everything. And we realized, wow, you know, this is gonna be unbelievable as to how are we gonna manage this? So we had to deal with two things, the incredible demand that people want in because they didn't want to, you know, lose their running freedom, but also the enhanced level of security. So I went to public safety and I said, I have a question and that is, are you gonna build security around the event or are we gonna have to rebuild the event around security? And the response, immediate response was, no, we'll build security around the event. Well, just the opposite happened, right? Because we couldn't do anything until the security plan was being sort of finalized. So you don't know if you can park that truck there, if you could put that tent there anymore, where checkpoints were gonna be, or uh, can you transport gear bags anymore and not, and all that kind of stuff. So we sort of had to wait till we can plan this thing. On top of that, we decided to allow all 6,500 runners who didn't finish to come back. And then we totally increased the field size by over 9,000. So we almost had the same field size as we had for the 100th, which is close to 40,000. And that's a lot of people for a small town of Hopkinton and a very, very narrow course. So we had one of the the second largest race in the history of of the marathon, combined with an enhanced level of security. He gasped, man, how's this gonna work? But it worked perfectly. It worked perfectly. People understood. People recognized that this is a special year. And then, of all things, you couldn't write a better script. You had an American win, Meb Kofleski. He wins the race. He had the four names of the victims who passed in the bombing um, on his bib number. Um, it was a, a race like that. We'll we'll never see that again. It was. Uh, first of all, I, I need to say that you're the first person on the show to ever say "egats." <laughs> That is an expression that I don't know that I've ever heard or used, and I love it because coming from you, it sounds perfect. So 2014 happens. I remember that race. If you're, even if you're not an endurance runner, you remember how Boston came back. You remember the Boston Red Sox, Boston Strong, and winning the World Series, just every part of Boston coming back. So you're thinking to yourself, I'm still going to direct this. I still have the urge and the desire. I mean, what more could happen? This is it, right? I mean, the worst possible thing, people lost their lives. So you go on a few years, a few years past, we're gonna get to the marathon that I did with you in Boston, but let's go to this year. And uh, all of a sudden, you're getting ready to plan and COVID happens. Mm -hmm. So sports shut down in March. It was March 11th when Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive and Adam Silver, the commissioner of basketball, shut down the NBA. And that was the first domino. And that was it. There was a complete sport shutdown. What day, because I know it's in your head, 
We've never talked about it nor rehearsed this, so I'm taking a chance. Do you remember the moment when you said, wow, I'm not sure that the April race is going to happen? And because uh, the Boston Marathon always happens on Patriots Day in Boston, same day, same Monday of Patriots Day every single year. When did you have the realization that COVID was not just going to get in the way of the race, that it was going to actually stop the race? Well, um, you know, the, the, the biggest race right before Boston is the Los Angeles Marathon. And I'm good friends with the race director there. So I called him up in March and I said, Murph, what, what's going on with your race? And he says, well, right now, city councilors are saying all systems go. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, the virus is out there. It's not even here yet. And you're all systems go. So I thought in my head, well, if he's a go, we, we sort of have we got to be a go, right? And, and then it just got worse and worse and worse. And then we recognized that this is more than just a BAA decision. This is a city of Boston decision. This is a Commonwealth of Massachusetts decision. And then it was really, really hitting the fan by mid-March. And, and that's when the, uh, the mayor got together with the governor. And it was basically the city's decision to, to postpone the race. So we had to think about well when would be the most appropriate time if we gave it enough runway between you know April and in the fall and we said well historically it's always been on a Monday and but we looked at Labor Day no that's that's not going to work we looked at Columbus Day weekend no nah, that's not going to work either and then we said well we'll just make up a whole new holiday <laughs> so we picked September 14th and the governor says, okay, uh, we're gonna go to the state legislature and declare September 14th a state holiday. And they did. And so that's what the plan was, that the race was gonna be postponed till September, which in and of itself was just mind boggling that that could ever even happen. And then as we go along, we're realizing things aren't getting any better. In fact, they're getting worse and then you know, everyone got back together and together again and said, it doesn't even look like it's going to work for September. And that's, you know, in July, I think it was um, when it was actually canceled. And now we're, we're going virtual. So the Boston Marathon was going to be in April, you postponed to September, you and I spoke during the interim period. And we talked about whether or not September was even realistic. I was wondering whether the Red Sox would have a game scheduled for that day as well, because that would be interesting because they always play on that day. And you are a race director, you're most famous for the Boston Marathon, but you direct tons of other races, small, nothing larger than Boston, but tons of races of all different distances from 5Ks up to marathons. Uh, did you embrace the virtual running. So here's what's happening for those of you listening who aren't runners. Uh, race directors have had to, like many other businesses, find a way to adjust. It's a game of adjustments. And there's been virtual runs where you sign up for a run and you do the mileage on your own with the honor system. You pay an amount of money that some of it goes to charity. And then you get a medal because you put your time in online and you get a medal as though you had crossed the finish line. And that's what's known as a virtual run. Some of them you can do whenever you want. Some of them you do on a specific race day. How did this year's virtual Boston come together? Well, you know, when, when these races were all going over the cliff, now I had 35 races in, in, in charity walks lock and loaded for the year. This was going to be a banner year for DMSE Sports, my company. And we've been doing this almost longer than any other event management company in the country. For over 40 years, I've been producing events. And this was going to be the most successful one based on all the contracts I had with all the different clients. And then one by one, they started going over the cliff. And races were, and I don't own any events I manage. I just manage them. I get in, manage them, get out, move on to the next one. And that works for me. I designed it that way. So I don't take any of the risks. That, well, at least I didn't think I did at the time. And um, so as they're going over the cliff, some of them are deciding to go virtual. And I'm like, well, there's no road cones in virtual. So do you still need us? And they go, no, we can do this on our own. We don't need an event management company. We just have social media and digital media people. And so now I'm, I'm out of a job. So I lost every single event. 
and since then had to lay off most of my staff. So this has profoundly affected my business. So then when races were going virtual, I was like, really? You're gonna pay like $40, $50 to run around your neighborhood and get a shirt in the mail and a medal in the mail? And I, I, I never really gave it a lot of credibility and then I started reading about some of these events around the country that went virtual and some of them are getting 10,000 people, 20,000 people. And I'm like 20,000 people times 50 bucks. That's a million dollars. Like maybe there is something to this. So I said, we, we, we got we to gotta pivot and we got to get into this virtual thing. And then a suggestion was made to sort of do a virtual run across America which would simulate my solo run across America back in 1978 when I ran from Medford, Oregon to Medford, Massachusetts, 3,452 miles to raise money for the Jimmy Fund in Boston. And we thought, well, that could be a good template to use. Dave, Dave I'm interrupting you. You yeah. just blew off one of the coolest things ever. Yeah. You just, people, if you missed it, rewind the pod. Rewind YouTube by 40 seconds. Dave McGilvery just said that in 1978, he yeah. ran from Medford, Oregon, which is on the West Coast, to Medford, Massachusetts, where I went to college for a year. That's where Tufts University is. Medford to Medford. So 3,452 miles. How many years did that take you? <laughs> 80 days. You, you did 3,452 miles in 80 days. Yes, sir. How many miles a day is that? That's going to be almost 40. That's over. That's 40 miles a day. Yeah. The first month I averaged 42 in the last two months, I averaged 50 a day. Every day. Every day, not a day off. You didn't take a day off in 80 straight not days. Day off. Not one day you, off. You ran, you ran an ultra marathon every day for yes. 80 days. Yes. And how old were you? 23. And I turned 24 while I was on it. And what were your injuries during these, these 80 days? I only suffered one um, interesting story really quick. Um, so I was in the desert in Ely, Nevada, and I'm running 15 miles that day. And also my left knee, a muscle, the vastus medialis muscle, kind of really got really sore and tightened up and really hurt me. And I not only could I not run, I couldn't walk. And I'm like, I got 2,000 more miles to go. I'm trying to raise money for sick kids and I can't even walk. So the guys who were with me, I had a support crew of three people following me in a motorhome, threw me in the motorhome, drove 40 miles to the, uh, to the nearest hospital and I walk into the emergency room and the doctor looks at it and he goes, well, what do you think caused it? I said, I don't know. I said, I was out jogging and uh, it just happened. If I told him I was running 50 miles a day, he'd say, well, don't do that, you know? Um, so he just gave me some anti-inflammatories and said, take a couple of weeks off. And I said, okay, good, I'm good. I, the guys threw me back in the motorhome, drove out to where I had stopped. And I said, just let me out. I gotta, I gotta get through this. And then I realized what the problem was. And it wasn't that I wasn't in shape or my body couldn't sustain this. I said, there's, there's, you always want to treat the cause, not as much the problem, the cause. What is causing this? And I knew I was fit enough to run 40, 50 a day. And I realized I was running all my miles on one side of the road. And in the, especially in the desert, for the water runoff, the, the road is really crowned. So one leg is really doing more work than the other. And so I started alternating each side of the road. I don't like running with traffic. I always like to run to see what's gonna, you know, what's gonna run me over. And so, but I said, I'm not gonna make it unless I switch sides of the road. So I switched sides of the roads and in two days it all went away. It went away and that injury subsided and I never had another problem the rest of the way. How many pairs of sneakers did you go through in 80 days? Eight pair. So I had eight pair. And what's interesting about that is I never wore them out because you wear out shoes, you wear out your body. And every time I ran 10 miles and took a little break in the motorhome, 10, 15 minutes, ran another 10, another little break, another 10, another break. Every time I went to the motorhome, I changed the shoes. And it kind of gave me a whole refresher, a new life. Like I was almost like hadn't run that first 10 miles or that second 10 miles in a day. And that's how I was, I was able to get through it. And it's lessons learned here. That is, you know, you can be really fit and you can be tough, but you gotta be smart. And you have to figure things out. Like what, how can I, how can I define the odds here? How can I set this up where I'm gonna create this for success, not failure? And these little nuances are the things that got me through it.
there's no one listening to this who will say that you're smart, right? They're going to say you ran 80 days straight yeah. of an ultra marathon, right? There's something wrong because that's something, and I'm an endurance guy. I can't even comprehend that fact. You helped me do my first ultra marathon. I've done another one since I'm training for yet another one, but every doing it every single day, were you, you how long did you train for that Dave? Well, in my mind, every, every step I was taking for the four years prior to it was geared towards that. But I, you don't train per se to run across the country because it's not like you're going to go run 30, 40 miles a day to get ready to run 30, 40 miles a day. You know, so, so for me, it was more just a, a physical, mental, and emotional buildup. And then I did one thing uh, a year before it. I drove my car to from Boston to Rochester, New York. It was over 400 miles. And every 40 miles, I booked a motel room. And then I drove home. And then a week later, I put a backpack on my back. And I ran from Boston to Rochester, New York, 400 miles in 10 days. And, um, you know, stayed in the motels along the way. And then um, I, I said to myself, what I have always said, you have to earn the right to do these things. You can't just recklessly on a barroom um, stool, you know, commit to doing these things. You have to earn it. And I felt like, okay, I think I've earned it now. I'm ready to go. That was my training. So you did a virtual, you decided to do a race. I'm going to, I got to move on to something, but I do want to show you what just came in the mail today. I just opened it literally today. Oh, no. I got a medal. This is the Medford to Medford medal because I signed up for the virtual race with many, many people, by the way, because I think I only did 400 miles while you did 3,400 miles, but I still got a very cool medal. It's the first medal I have. And I don't know if you can see this on YouTube, but there's a, there's, what is it? There's a shoe that's yeah. showing the route from Medford to Medford. So yeah. Dave, I feel as though I don't deserve this medal because I didn't run Medford to Medford. I ran like Medford to the outskirts <laughs> of Medford. Actually, I can say that I ran from Boston to Rochester because I think I did around 400 miles. Yeah, but you were part of a team that did go all the way across and back again. So it's a team thing. You're a team player. It, is, it isn't just about one ball player. You know, uh, you know, it's the team, and that's a team medal. So. so you say, this is the perfect segue, Coca, by the way. You say that you can't say yes to something on a barroom stool because you have to properly prepare before saying yes. So let me take you back to a great moment when I picked up the phone and I said, Dave, I got a plan. And you said, what's up, Dave? You always have a plan. I said, no, this one is crazy. Dave, what would you say to join me in running seven marathons in seven days on seven different continents? And you actually had your breath taken away and you've accomplished everything. You've done everything. And you actually paused and took a beat before a green to at least consider doing this. Do you remember that phone call? I do, of course. It was um, one of the highlights uh, in my athletic career, getting that phone call. It truly was, and I'll tell you why. Not only because it came from you as a personal friend, not only because it was about um, another daunting goal that I could set for myself, but it came on the heels of me being diagnosed um, with severe coronary artery disease, mainly due to uh, genetics. And I was hesitant because I said, I have this coronary artery disease now that I didn't know I had. And can I really commit to something like this? And I actually hesitated. I didn't give you an answer right away, as I recall. And I said, I got to think about this. And can I get myself back into that kind of shape? 63 years old, not 23 years old. Can I run marathons back to back to back to back to back? I hadn't done that in almost 40 years. And then what I ended up doing is three weeks before the Boston Marathon, I left my house on a Monday and I went out and ran around my neighborhood 26 miles, came back in. Tuesday, I woke up, ran around the neighborhood 26 miles. Boom. Wednesday, I woke up, ran around the neighborhood 26 miles. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I did a half marathon on each of those days. And on Sunday of that week, I ran the Boston Marathon course. I ran four marathons and three half marathons in a week. I said, I'm going. I've earned the right. I am going. 
You, you also had to call your doctor. I did. And you had to get permission. And I remember when you called me to say that you were going to do it, I believe you had committed before you did the four marathons and three half Probably marathons. Did. Yeah. Because we had built this team and this was a two a year and a half sort of preparation, including some training weekends and just all sorts of insanity. So seven marathons, for those of you who don't know, there's only about 200 people in the world who have ever done this. So you're part of that group. I'm part of a group with you where you start in Antarctica and you run a marathon. You then fly to South Africa, Africa, run a marathon. We then flew to Australia and ran a marathon. Then to Dubai, which is Asia, ran a marathon. These are consecutive days. But the most commonly asked question about the 777 is, so is that in a row or is that in a year? So I get that. Also, how many miles do you have to run in each of the continents? I get that asked a lot where you say, no, no, it's a full marathon in every single continent. It literally blows people's minds that we yeah. did this. And you then agreed to do it. We put together this team of people and we raised over a million dollars for charity, including some of your charities. Yeah. And I, I, I want to talk about a moment during 777, one of my <laughs> memories. I know you know what I'm going to say. Okay. I can't run with you, Dave, because I'm not good enough. But in Antarctica, <laughs> you were willing to run the Antarctica Marathon with me. And we ran all 26 miles together. And when you run in Antarctica, we ran on an ice runway. What they do is they land a plane on a runway, which they create out of the ice and the plane lands, and then the plane taxis off the runway, they put some cones down, and you just do four laps around the runway. And that's the Antarctica Marathon. And it is freezing cold, it is windy, and it's insane because it's the first of seven straight marathons. So I run with you, and we crossed the finish line together, and I was hurting. I didn't know how I had six more in me. And, uh, do you want to give the line that you gave about that day? Or would you like me to? I'd like you to deliver it because it was so good. I, I, I turned to you and I just, you know, I was excited that we had finished together, but I said, hey, I just, I just set up PR or PB. And you're like, you did? I said, yeah. It's like a personal record for, for the slowest marathon I've ever run in my life. I didn't mean, to, it was like, so, I don't know, I guess I insulted you and I didn't mean to. It's not that you were insulting me. It was so funny. We're sitting there. Once the Antarctic Marathon ends, you basically get on the plane and fly to Africa and start running in Africa where we ran in Cape Town. But you, you go into this kitchen area. We did it on a Russian base. Literally, there's no little known fact here. There's no time zones in Antarctica. So you can make whatever time you want. And so the time we were at was time in Russia, because what they do is if it's a Russian based base, then they make it the time in Russia. So everyone knows what time it is. And we were there with a bunch of men on the base. As you recall, they hadn't seen a woman in over a year. Do you remember how they reacted to some people in our group? And yeah. uh, that was something. So we go into their kitchen where we had some food and we were waiting to board the plane to leave. And you come up to me and I'm, and I'm trying to recover and I'm with some other people on the team. And you say, hey man, that was a PR personal record. And I started thinking, wow, did we, how fast did we go? Because I wasn't thinking, I was like delirious. And then you said, yeah, that's the slowest I've <laughs> ever had to run. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Did I ever apologize for that? You don't need to. It's just, it's so funny to me. Yeah. But um, so tell me about your number one memory because you did do seven marathons in seven days. Our whole team finished. We had so many memories made on that seven day trip. Do you, re was that, is that a really a highlight of your career? Because if you say that and mean it, it's, it's unreal to me. Oh, it certainly is. I mean, for me, it wasn't as much about the running because that's what I do, right? It was more the rat race in between. And I really thought the thing that was going to fry me if, if I wasn't going to be able to get this thing done was sleep deprivation because I just couldn't get to sleep. And I remember I kept coming up to you saying, you got to give me something to make me sleep because I got these things on my eyes and the earplugs and the whole bit and it's not happening. And I'm like, if I don't get any sleep, I'm going to crash and burn by the third one. And maybe I'll be so exhausted by the third one, when it, you know, right after Perth or something like that. I'm just going to like, this is going to be great. Never happened. So I probably slept three hours each flight 
which obviously isn't enough. And then even the diet thing, you know, everyone has their own particular diets, but you ate what they put in front of you. It isn't like, you know, you could go to the grocery store. So between the diet stuff and the lack of sleep and, and you're recovering at 35,000 feet and you got these compression boots on and like, you can't train for that stuff. And so those are the things I thought was going to fry me. But I, I did pretty well. I was very, very consistent. I was running 430s, 428s the whole time. I was very, very consistent. And then in, uh, then all of a sudden we get to Liz, uh, we get to uh, Cartagena in Colombia. That's day uh, six. That's the sixth marathon, Cartagena. And not for anything, but that was a disaster. <laughs> because they started us in the old city, as you know, and we went out into the main city and we all got lost. And none of us knew where the heck we were going. And then the race people were saying, well, just look at your GPS watch and you'll know how far you're in when you run 26.2, stop. And I'm like, I don't have a GPS on. I was depending on them. And then I got a really bad shin problem in my leg and I thought, oh, I'm doomed. And I was able to finish it. And then I got to, I got to Miami and I thought, I don't know if I can do this because my shin was hurting so bad. And then I was taking these anti-inflammatories and they were upsetting my stomach and I was vomiting. And I said, this thing is all coming apart for me. But I was able to get the Miami one done. In fact, the, the last 10 miles were the fastest 10 miles of the entire trip for me. So it was just an uh, epic uh, adventure. And I owe it all to you, David Sampson. I really do. Well, that was an adventure of a lifetime and a lifetime of adventures that we've had where we try to do things. What I love about running, and it's, it's a slogan that you have, is uh, you know, just because you're fit doesn't mean you're healthy. And you talked about your coronary heart disease and you ended up having surgery and you basically have taught millions of people through books that you've written and through speeches that you give, that just because I run marathons, it doesn't mean that that makes me healthy. It means I'm fit, but you still have to go to doctors. You still have to understand the role that genetics play. And you have made a life of making a difference in other people's lives. And I don't think that people understand or give you enough credit because it's easy to be ordinary and it's very difficult to be extraordinary. And you are extraordinary in literally every single thing you do, Dave. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I always feel we're all in this thing together and we're all equal and no one's better than anyone else. I just, some, some are older and have experienced more. But for me, my mission now is about creating an awareness. You know, there's a, there's a public safety campaign in Massachusetts that says, if you see something, say something. And my campaign now is if you feel something, say something. So right after 777, and it wasn't because of 777, it was because of genetics. Um, you know, I could feel that discomfort in my chest again and went back to Mass General Hospital and had an angiogram and they said, you have 95% blockage in your main artery. And I said, well, what are my options? And he said, well, one is you can, you can not do anything and live a sedentary life. And I said, well, cross that one off. And he said, well, we can stent it, but it's near the heart. And I said, I'm not taking any risk. Cross that off. He said, oh, we can do open heart, triple bypass surgery. I said, nah, I don't like that one either. Cross that off. He said, well, you've run out of options. I said, well, I said, well, and then I have a question for you. And he said, what? I said, there's this little, in six months, there's this little jogathon in April, right, in Boston. And I shuffled through it a couple of times. What do you think? And he gave me the best possible answer. He didn't say, no, I don't think you should do it or could, or yes, I think you can. He said, I'd be extremely disappointed if you couldn't do it. And that gave me the thing I think we all need, especially in this time of the pandemic, and that is hope, hope. I got hope. And so I said, okay, I'm going to delicately train for this. I, I have to recover, but at the same time, I have to train because you can't just do it off a bat. So I did that. And then I decided, you know, I want a special team of people to join me for this momentous occasion. And I asked you and other members of the 777, and we decided to do it together as a group, a reunion of sorts. And I remember just about crossing the finish line. And my son Luke was with me and a little boy by the name of Jack Middlemas. Jack had um, uh, our heart transplant done only six months ago. And I was raising money for his 
foundation, his parents' foundation, because his brother had died of a similar illness that he had. Um, and as, as a result, he was there and he ran the last 100 yards with us, crossing the finish line. And it was the most memorable marathon, my 47th Boston in a row. And it just goes to show you that, you know, we're not invincible. And I thought, I thought I was, you know, I kind of think, well, oh, Superman, you know, a little bit, you know, there's no kryptonite in my life. Well, yes, there is. And you got to pay attention. And, um, you know, I have seven friends of mine went out for a run one day and never come home. So just because you've run 150,000 miles or you've run 157 marathons, I've done Ironman, I've done 777, that doesn't mean that something like this can't happen to you. So pay attention and act on it. Advocate for yourself. Um, you are the most important person in the world. And the only way you're going to help someone else is to help yourself. That is perfectly put. Before we end, and I could talk to you for another hour to tell you the truth, but I want to bring up an idea to you. Because yeah. what would this sit down be without me saying, Dave, I got an idea. Uh -oh. Ready? We've talked about it, but it has never come to fruition. But I think it's time. Would you have any interest in doing the Mount Everest marathon with me? Yeah, we have talked about it. So it's a matter of just planning and, you know, just. This is a bar stool. Let's explain what it is. <laughs> it's not climbing to the summit of Mount Everest because I'm not capable of doing that. But this is actually climbing to base camp, which is still around 19,000 square feet. You get there and then you run a marathon and it's called yeah. the Mount Everest Marathon. Not very many people do it. And uh, it is something that has been on my bucket list. Do you have things on your bucket list still? Yeah, I think, let's see, next Wednesday, laundry, and then Friday, I think I need to get the mail out of the mail. But I have nothing. Unfortunately, like I, what we were ending up with is this pandemic and the fact that all my events have gone over and I've had to pivot and do, you know, virtual events or drive in movies, you know, with cars and stuff. So, so we're just trying to, we're trying to figure it out. I don't know when this is all going to come back and maybe not even in 2021. So um, time used to be an enemy and it's, it's not right now. Well, I'd like you to consider climbing Mount Everest with me. We can put a group together, we can raise money for charity, and then we can get another medal to go with your collection of unbelievable medals. Dave, I, I really thank you for your time. If, sure. you, if you don't follow him, you should. He's on Instagram, he's on Twitter. What is your Twitter handle and Instagram handle? Just uh, Dave at DMSE. Dave DMSE. at, that sounds like an email, Dave. Are you sure that's yeah. an Instagram handle? No, it's just DMSE. D okay, Just Dave. DMSE. I don't even know it. I don't. I'm not on all that. What stuff. a perfect self promoter. I have other people doing it for me. Yeah. So the fact is that he has written several children's books. Aren't you writing one about Triple Seven? You did. I am. I am. And it's called Finish Strong, and um, that's the next book that's coming out in a few months. Yep. Will you send an autographed copy? Can I buy some and give them away? You can't buy any, but I, you can you can have some to give away. Yes. I can't wait, Dave. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you. You're the man.